I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Charles Fletcher, Associate Dean and Professor of Geology and Geophysics at the University of Hawaii, and also a chair of Honolulu Climate Change Commission. Some of you may know that Hawaii is the site of the groundbreaking study from the 1960s to 2000s that showed rising atmospheric CO2. And Dr. Fletcher's research going on today is equally groundbreaking in coastal erosion, changes to groundwater and sea level rise that provide clear cut evidence that we are approaching major scientific climate tipping points that may make some places such as reef islands uninhabitable. He is the author of 100 peer reviewed articles and three textbooks, so it would be accurate to describe him as a man who wrote the book on climate change. So please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Charles Fletcher. Rowan, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction. We are going to talk about this pivotal decade in the climate crisis. But we have parallel and overlapping planetary crises related to biodiversity loss, disease, and human equality as well. By now, we're all familiar with the rise of temperature. This is from the US uh, National Aeronautical and Space Administration. Sir James, excuse me, <laughs> Dr. Uh, James Hansen. Uh, is uh, the former lead scientist for NASA is now speculating in his monthly newsletters that we are seeing uh, an acceleration in the rate of warming based on the last six years. Uh, the seventh year here, the very most recent year, um, has come in below the long-term trend, but this is because we are experiencing a La Nina here in the Pacific, uh, which tends to take heat out of the atmosphere and bury it in the Pacific Ocean temporarily, uh, by the next El Nino, which may be uh, within a few years, we're likely to temporarily cross into the 1.5 degrees Celsius um, temperature uh, zone. This is the uh, rise in um, CO2 that uh, Rowan referred to. Early in the time series, the growth of CO2 in the atmosphere was less than one part per million per year, uh, but today it is growing at nearly two and a half parts per million per year. So we do know that there is an acceleration in the rate of carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere. In fact, we have now increased atmospheric CO2 more than 50% over the pre-industrial level of 278 parts per million and more than half of our anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions have occurred since 1988, uh, when Dr. Jim Hansen testified to the US Congress uh, that he was 99% certain that climate change was real and we were witnessing the effects already. Because of the uh, damaging nature of climate change, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was successful in um, 2015, getting the world's nations to agree to stop global warming before it reached two degrees Celsius. And led by Sir David King, uh, a stronger target of pursuing efforts to end warming before 1.5 degrees C uh, was also agreed to. A few years later, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a report specifically on this target, 1.5 C, uh, and it concluded that warming will persist for centuries to millennia. And we will see increases in hot extremes, storminess, drought, sea level rise, species loss and extinction, uh, major impacts to our marine systems, um, and decreased food and water security, and decreased human safety. With this, 1.5 became the new global target. And on this graph, we're going to look at our progress towards achieving this target. On the bottom axis will be the years 2010 to 2050. And on the vertical axis will be carbon dioxide emissions. This black line is the 
uh, history of emissions over the last decade. We had record setting CO2 emissions in 2019. As we entered the COVID recession globally, CO2 emissions fell by 5.4%, but in coming out of the recession, they have risen again uh, and are nearly back up to the record setting levels of uh, 2019. Keep in mind, we need to cut these emissions in order to stop warming and the pathway to achieving the 1.5 degree uh, Celsius uh, target is shown in the green. As of the Glasgow meeting, uh, the announced promises or pledges from the world's nations put us on a pathway of two and a half to 2.8 degrees Celsius. But in fact, when you look at the uh, actual policies of the world's nations, looking at the uh, energy policies, transportation and food production policies, we're actually on a pathway to over three degrees Celsius. <clears throat> this represents a gap between what is pledged and what our actual policies are on the global stage. Uh, and every year the United Nations come out, comes out with what's known as the gap report. However, there's more to the story. <clears throat> During the Glasgow meeting, the Washington Post released an in-depth analysis that showed on average, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are underreported around the planet by 23%. And we just heard a month ago that methane emissions from the energy sector are 70% higher than official figures. Methane is responsible for around 30% of global warming it dissipates faster than carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but it's much more powerful at trapping heat and cutting methane emissions would have a rapid effect on limiting global warming. Now averaged over the last decade, 86% of our CO2 emissions uh, are the result of burning fossil fuels and about 14% of our CO2 emissions are the result of land use practices. About 46% of these emissions go into the atmosphere and trap excess heat that would otherwise escape to space. About 31% is absorbed by photosynthesis in the terrestrial uh, biosphere. And 23% of our annual emissions are dissolved in the ocean, producing ocean acidification. So this 31% is an important partner in our efforts to manage this problem. Unfortunately, uh, we're seeing the degradation of the terrestrial biome. Plant photosynthesis removes CO2 from the air, but plant respiration releases CO2 in water. And photosynthesis has a heat limit, a thermal maximum, past which the absorption of carbon dioxide sharply declines, but respiration or release of CO2 continues to increase. Carbon uptake by land plants is already degrading. And with continued emissions, models are projecting that carbon uptake may be uh, decreased by as much as 50% in only two decades. This effect is also not accounted for in national policies. We only need to look at news coming out of the Amazon basin, which contains more than half of all tropical rainforest. Logging, mining, hunting, deforestation, damming, drought, tree mortality due to uh, rising heat, these combined have led to the loss of one third of all biomass over the last decade. And from 2010 to 2019, Brazil's portion of the Amazon basin released 18 billion tons of carbon dioxide, but only absorbed 15 billion tons. It's now likely that the Amazon is a net source of greenhouse gas emissions. A paper just came out this week. Deforestation and global warming could push the Amazon past critical thresholds, leading to forest dieback. Local fires and drought could tip it uh, the system into a system of megafires, deforest, deforestation, largely for agriculture and forest degradation, uh, leads to drought because the Amazon makes its own rain through evapotranspiration. 
the Amazon rainforest is taking longer to recover from drought. It used to take on the order of one to three years, but it's now taking three to five years according to satellite information. And satellite evidence shows that already 17% of the Amazon is gone. It's growing more arid. Drought events are increasing. There've been three 100 year drought events this century. And there's been a pronounced increase in human deforestation, fire, hunting, and damming. Models indicate that at about 20% loss, the Amazon could go into a uh, system of amplifying feedbacks where forest is replaced by grasslands or savanna. The world is growing hotter, especially on land in the summer. Combined heat and humidity known as wet bulb temperature of 35 degrees C marks the human physiological limit. Extreme humid heat overall has more than doubled in frequency since 1979. And we now know that over one third of summer heat related deaths among humans is attributable to climate change. There are amazing number of papers coming out now related to the rise of uh, heat events that exceed human tolerance. Scientists are describing super and ultra extreme heat waves, deadly heat waves projected in the densely populated ag agriculture regions of South Asia, escalating global exposure to compound heat and humanity extremes with warming. And this paper published in the Proceedings of the US National Academy of Sciences. Future of the human climate niche. Today, about eight tenths of 1% of the land surface on this planet is too hot for human existence. These black areas in the central Sahara and along the shores of the Red Sea uh, are considered too hot for human communities. But at three degrees C on which we are following a current pathway within 50 years, five zero years, we're looking at the expansion of this zone to all of the diagonal dark brown hatching. This represents nearly one fifth of the global land surface, expanding to become too hot for human existence. And we're looking at huge portions of Central America and South America, North Africa, the Middle East, India, Southeast Asia, and North Australia. In fact, at today's warming of one degree C, models are projecting an additional 1 billion people displaced for every additional one degree C of global warming. Climate change and expanding human needs have led to water and food impacts. Today, we are withdrawing from the aquifers in the continental US 17% more water the nature can replace every year. China is withdrawing 22% more water than can be naturally recharged. India, 52%, and the North Africa and the Middle East, more than 1,000% more water is being removed from aquifers than nature is able to recharge. By 2050, water demand is projected to grow by 55%. In fact, today, one quarter of humanity already faces a looming water crisis every year. There are 17 nations under extremely high water stress, meaning that they use almost all the water they have. And if you look closely at the southern peninsula of India, the mega city of Chennai, with over 10 million people, actually ran out of water three years ago. All four of its major reservoirs ran dry. Food also experiences a decrease in micronutrients as the CO2 level in the air increases. Under high, higher CO2, uh, maize, rice, soy, and wheat have up to 13% less protein, zinc, vitamin B complex, and iron. We can look at wheat as an example, which provides one fifth of human protein on this planet. The yield of wheat is threatened by drought, flood, and higher carbon dioxide. 
And by mid-century, demand for wheat is projected to increase by 60%, while the actual yield is projected to decline by 15. By 2050, an additional 300 million people will be malnourished. An additional 1.4 billion women and children are likely to have iron deficiency. Climate change could displace 216 million people by 2050. Rising sea levels, water scarcity, and declining crop productivity could force 216 million people to migrate within their own countries by 2050. Hotspots will emerge as soon as this decade, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, South Asia, East Asia and the Pacific, Latin America, and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. This represents a crisis in global security. Even at scenarios of low warming, each region of the world will face severe risks to natural, national and global security in the next three decades. Higher levels of warming will pose catastrophic and likely irreversible global security risks over the course of the 21st century. The natural world and wild places are being sacrificed to our desire for human consumption. Since 1970, per person consumption has increased by roughly 60% and global economic activity has grown by 400%. Much of this growth has come at the expense of the natural world, which is now managed to keep up with rising demands for food, energy, timber, paper, minerals, and more. This represents an unparalleled appropriation of nature, which is causing the fabric of life on which humanity depends to fray and unravel. Since 1970, food crop production increased by 300%. And half of all agriculture expansion has come at the expense of forests. In 2019, the rate of deforestation was one football field every six seconds. More than half of this was to raise cattle and the grain to feed them. 43% of all ice and desert free land. Two thirds of all fresh water is for human food production. Over 80% of farmland is used for livestock, but it produces just 18% of calories and 37% of protein. Cattle and the grain they eat use one third of available land surface on this planet, 16% of all available fresh water, and one third of worldwide grain production. Producing beef generates 100 times more greenhouse gas than plant-based food. 86% of all land mammals are now livestock or humans. Of all birds, 70% are poultry. Human consumption and population growth, intensive farming, these have destroyed 68% of vertebrate wildlife on this planet over the last 50 years. This has led to the era of pandemics. We've had 335 new infectious diseases that have emerged since 1970. 60% of all new pathogens and 75% of new or emerging infectious diseases are known as zoonotic disease. That is, they jump species from animals to human communities. Ebola, HIV, malaria, West Nile, anthrax, encephalitis, Zika, SARS, MERS, COVID-19. These are familiar names to all of us. These spillover events occur when microbes carried by animals cross into humans through contact between wildlife and livestock and human populations. And there are classically four venues for these spillover events. One is habitat loss. Roughly one third of new zoonotic diseases are directly attributed to deforestation and habitat loss. 40% of the world's original forests have been eliminated and this brings humans in contact with deep ecosystems that were previously insulated from us. Only 2.9% of Earth's land surface remains faunally intact. The second venue for spillover is extreme weather events, where flood, wildfire, and heat displace humans and pathogens and bring them together. This is also a time when human immune systems are weakened and disease is a major problem following disaster events. The third spillover venue is vector expansion. 
as we um, hunt and destroy the ecosystems of apex species, we're finding small mammals, rats, and rodents are expanding in population. And these are successful organisms who know how to live among human communities. The tropics are expanding. Mice, mosquitoes, ticks, deer, and other carriers are moving into human communities that had not seen them before. And concentrated animal feeding operations, where we raise thousands of poultry or hundreds of pigs or cattle in a closed environment, Pathogens radiate through this community of animals, and when animals die, they are replaced with living animals so that there's no natural selection against the most virulent forms of the pathogens. In nature, a pathogen cannot afford to kill its host, but in a concentrated animal feeding operation, the most virulent pathogens find success because we constantly put new animals in to act as hosts. These are breeding grounds for the most virulent forms of disease. And we keep these animals alive by pumping them with antibiotics. Nearly two thirds of drugs that are important for human medicine in my country, the US, are sold for food animal use. Overuse of these medicines, of course, drives the rise and spread of bacterial disease. Disease, environmental damage, climate change, and human inequality form an amplifying feedback. The disadvantaged among us suffer disproportionately, resulting in greater inequality. And the ratio between the income of the highest and poorest 10% is 25% larger than it would be in a world without global warming. This is the history of carbon dioxide emissions since 1850. And this is the pathway we must follow in order to stop warming at 1.5 degrees. The two degree target is another 15 years out. This pathway consists of cutting our emissions in half in only eight years. Following this, we must remove CO2 from the air for the rest of the century and beyond. We have barely gotten started on this problem of removing carbon dioxide. Thank you. With that, I will uh, end with the acknowledgement that. It's going to take more than cutting emissions. We must engage in development that does not destroy nature. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that talk, Dr. Fletcher. That was informative and frightening, but also so clear. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Sir David King. Sir David King is the Special Representative for Climate Change and served for, under the UK government from 2013 to 2017. Prior to that, he was the government's Chief Scientific Advisor. Now, he is the Founder and Chair of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group, which is a collective of experts in different fields that come together to provide informed advice for governments and non-governmental bodies on the climate. Sir David is an internationally renowned voice in climate sciences and is particularly outspoken on the need for urgent action to avoid the catastrophic scenarios. It is a privilege to hand over now to Sir David King. I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you very much, Rowan, and delighted to be following my very close colleague, Chip Fletcher, who's given you a wonderful account uh, and as you've just said, a terrifying account of the state of the world. Now, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit more about that and then also focus on what I believe we need to be doing uh, to, to manage this, uh, this problem. Are we able, is my real question, to create a manageable future for humanity into a future that could possibly match our historical past? We're all used to looking back five, 6,000 years. How far into the future can we confidently look at the moment, given the trends that uh, Chip has been talking about? I, I have set up also, in addition to running the, the uh, uh, Climate Crisis Advisory Group, I've set up a uh, Centre for Climate Repair here at Cambridge, uh, and uh, it's within one of the colleges, Downing College. 
So let me just explain why I'm using the phrase climate repair as I go along. First of all, to connect easily with what uh, Chip has just said, next slide shows uh, a similar graph to what he was showing. In blue is carbon dioxide levels rising from 1700 to the present time. That, of course, is going to the pre-industrial era into the fully uh, fossil fuel based era that we've uh, been running forward on. But what I've also shown here is if you add in methane and methane and other uh, greenhouse gases, but methane is the major rising contributor. And it's interesting to note that methane emissions are rising. Isotope analysis demonstrates perhaps rather surprisingly that the more rapid increase occurring over the last 20 years has come from livestock. So it is this uh, remarkable dependence that our human population has developed for, for, human, from, for livestock products and in particular for meat. And as we look around the world, the emerging, rapidly emerging economies of the world, what we see is this rapid growth in a new global middle class. If I count the middle class as those who spend between 10 and $100 a day, middle class people in the world were 1 billion in the year 2000 and, and in the year 2022, here we are rapidly approaching eight uh, three and a half billion out of the total population of eight billion. So the middle class section of the population is rising very rapidly. And unfortunately, their eating habits are mirroring and imitating the eating habits of the West. And so meat consumption is going up very rapidly and other dairy products as well. So the, the real problem is that our total greenhouse gas level is now well over 420 parts per million. It is in excess of 500 parts per million in the atmosphere. And if we, if Chip and I go back 20 years, you would not find a climate scientist who's, who would say, we could have a manageable future at over 450 parts per million. Jim Hansen, who Chip referred to, has said, we should never exceed 350 parts per million. And here we are well over that figure today. Let me take you to the next slide and just once again, running through where we are. Let's just take all of the extreme weather events that occurred around the Northern Hemisphere during the last summer, summer 2021. We had floods in Germany. We had amazing heat waves in, in Lapland. Uh, we had scorching heat in Siberia and across Europe, uh, the rainfall, many people dying in China, all across the Northern Hemisphere, not only extreme weather events, but these were extreme, extreme weather events, temperature rises being recorded, not just the highest on record, but local temperature rises well over five, even 10 degrees centigrade above the highest temperatures previously recorded. Now, I'm just going to say a little bit about these extreme weather events. The Climate Crisis Advisory Group, 15 individuals from 11 different countries, all known experts in this field, but coming from different areas of expertise and from different parts of the world. We looked at this and published a paper uh, in at the end of August last year, while we were still in that summer, giving an attribution of all of these events to what is happening currently in the Arctic Circle region. Let me take you through this. Next slide, please. In the Arctic Circle region, we have noted a temperature rise way in excess of the average temperature rise across the planet. So here the average temperature rise going up to about 1.3, 1.35 degrees centigrade today above the pre-industrial level shown on the left hand side of the figure. But if you just take the Arctic Circle region alone and you still take the average through the year, this isn't a summer averaging, you'll see that the temperature rise has been considerably greater in the Arctic Circle region. In fact, a recent paper has concluded the Arctic Circle is now heating up at four times the rate of the rest of the world average. Now, let me 
explain that we fully understand why this is happening. It's happening much more quickly than the climate science theoreticians had predicted. And the reason is because there's a very big feedback series of events occurring, driving the temperature in that region up much higher than before. Next slide, please. So I just take you through here uh, the, the, the different aspects of what I've just described. So in the, the middle of the slide, the North Pole is up right towards the, the, the top end, of course, of that uh, sphere representing the planet. And these are, are temperature isotherms. And the, the purple indicates cold and the blue not so cold and the orange is, is warm. And so what, what we see is that the, the North Pole is no longer the, the coldest part of the Northern Hemisphere. And I'll take you through that in a moment. But on the left-hand side, we've got a, a satellite picture of, of the state of ice on Greenland. And you'll see the blue Arctic Ocean sitting there in the midsummer period, the North Pole midsummer period, the blue Arctic Ocean being exposed to sunlight. Now, of course, the Arctic Sea has been covered with ice for many hundreds of thousands of years. And this warm period that we're going through as a result of global warming means that that ice has been melting with a positive feedback. And we've, we are melting the ice so quickly that about 50% of the Arctic Ocean is now exposed to sunlight during the polar summer, just the three months when the sun returns to the North Pole. During the winter period, during the uh, period when the sun has gone over to the South Pole, we know that the Arctic sea, sea is covered with ice again, but it's a single layer which disappears very quickly as the temperature warms up. Now, one of the people I have on the uh, Climate Crisis Advisory Group is a Professor Tero Mustanen. He's a Finn from the University of Western Finland, and he has lived on the permafrost all his life. Uh, he lives by cutting holes in the ice and catching fish. Other people around him are the reindeer herders, and they're living a lifestyle that they have lived for what they believe is several thousand years living on the permafrost in the Arctic Circle region. Uh, the people up in the north of Europe are called the Sami people, and the people up in the north of, of America are called, of course, the Inuit people. I spoke to him in April this year, and we're just chatting. I said, what's the temperature at the moment? He said, it's pretty cold. It's about minus 30, but that's normal. It's a bit colder than normal, but we've learned how to live with this. I spoke to him at the end of July last year, and he said to me, you're not going to believe this. The local temperature is now plus 25 to plus 30 degrees centigrade, 60 degrees centigrade temperature rise. As that blue ocean warms up rapidly in the sunlight, remember sun shining 24 hours a day, the air above the Arctic Ocean warms and warms very rapidly. And the North Pole region is now one of the warmest regions during the polar summer in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and so what, what you see is that we have got a massive distortion in the wind that normally blows in a circular pattern around the uh, Arctic Circle. I'm going to show you a bit more of that in a moment. This is what underlies those extreme weather events all around the Northern Hemisphere last summer. On the right hand side is something that the climate scientists were very loath to talk about, methane emissions occurring from the Arctic region because ice in the form of a molecule, a methane hydrate, is trapped in the, in, in the permafrost. And as the permafrost warms up in this warm air, of course, methane is being emitted more and more rapidly. If you throw a match on the ice, you get a nice blue glow from the methane burning. 
However, what has happened more recently is much more dramatic than that with explosive release of methane, as I will show you in a moment. On the left-hand side, that ice on Greenland, which has been falling one winter after another snowfall for many thousands of years, that ice is now melting irreversibly. And I'm quoting the most recent IPCC report, which says, ice on land around the world, whether you're looking at the Himalayas, the Antarctic or the Arctic, is now melting irreversibly. And when all of the ice on Greenland has melted, we know the global sea levels will rise by about 6.5 meters. Global average sea level rises of about 23, 24 feet will follow from the loss of ice on Greenland. Now, if anyone says so, how long will it take? I don't think there's anyone who can predict. We know there are positive feedbacks in these uh, uh, melting events, and they certainly are there, but we can't really predict. It may well take 200, 300 years to happen, but sea level rises of 23 feet, there's not a single city on a coastline around the world and about 80 percent of our cities have been built on coastlines that could possibly survive anything like that and certainly cities like london and new york and uh, mumbai will be underwater with less than a meter sea level rise perhaps even one and a half meters so we're looking at a very serious challenge to humanity from what is happening in the arctic circle region let me just take you to these explosive releases of methane first observed in 2014 next slide please is a photograph of the crater left after one of these explosive releases that crater uh, is it measures about 50 meters diameter about 60 70 meters deep and it results from the formation of a great bubble of methane from the decomposition of the methane hydrate below the surface of the permafrost and when that uh, when the gravitational force of the permafrost above the bubble of methane is less than the pressure of course it blows off and all of the material in there which is basically ice methane and carbon dioxide with a little bit of earth blows up into the air as water vapor as as methane and as carbon dioxide methane if i take the instantaneous impact on climate change is about 120, 130 times more effective per molecule than carbon dioxide as a global warming gas. And so this is something that could be extremely serious. If this happened within the half-life of methane in the atmosphere, this is the rate at which it disperses, is around 12 years. If, if a significant amount of methane emits in less than two half-lives, we are going to see temperature rises of five, maybe 10 degrees centigrade globally rise. Right? The rise is going to be enormous. Now, of course, what we want to see is if we can stop all of these events from happening. Next slide, please. Have I got a next slide? Oh dear. Thank you. Oops. No, I think you've gone too quickly. You've missed a few there. There we go. All right, so I just wanted to explain what I said about those extreme weather events having their origin in what's happening in the Arctic Circle region. On the left-hand side of this picture, you'll see a schematic of the effect of the jet stream, this wind that blows anti-clockwise around the North Pole. Uh, and it's a, it's a strong wind and it keeps the cold air, marked L, up in the Arctic Circle region and the warm air, equatorial air, down below, marked H. That's the classic picture with a cold Arctic. On the right-hand side, the warm Arctic, and this has happened particularly in the last three to four years, the warm Arctic, where we now have warm air over the Arctic Ocean, driving cold air down. Now, of course, as you drive cold air down in a great distortion 
of that jet stream, you must expect, because we can't have a vacuum, that the winds would come up from the equatorial region, bringing hot air back up to uh, towards the, the North Pole region. So you've got this movement of wind south and north creating this distortion in the, the jet stream. Now, these are schematic diagrams to explain uh, what I'm now going to show you, uh, where we are taking the actual uh, uh, distortion of the jet stream during the summer last year. Next slide, please. So what you see is that that jet stream got locked into place along the, the west coast of the United States, just into the ocean side of the west coast. And, and this distortion was driven by cold air blowing right down the center of the, of the United States and Canada. And so what, what we see is that this warm air coming up from the equatorial region is responsible for these exceedingly high temperatures. Lytton in British Columbia is marked because there they observed this record temperature, 49.8 degrees centigrade. And as Chip has just pointed out, a, 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 a temperature with anything like humidity of 30, 35, to 40 degrees centigrade is very, very difficult for human beings to live in, especially if they have no access to air conditioning. Lytton, what we might describe as an upper middle class town, had many deaths as a result of this because Lytton in Canada is a country, is a region where they do not expect to suffer from high temperatures during the summer. Of course, the jet stream distortion carries stormy extreme weather events and right along the east coast of uh, America, they witnessed all these uh, extreme events and floods and so on. So let me take you to the next slide. What do we do about all of this? And here I'm coming towards the end of what I have to say. Climate repair, our words attached to this are three R's, reduce, remove, and repair. Yes, we have to reduce emissions. We have to do this deeply and rapidly. And I've got to say, we have to do it in an orderly fashion and in a way that is equitable to all of humanity. In other words, what is required is for all nations to be pulling together in this enormous enterprise of switching ourselves away from fossil fuels, away from destroying our forests, and into a new mode of living in which our ecosystems are recognized for the critical function that they perform for all of us living creatures on the planet. That, I'm afraid, is a factor that has been ignored in our development over the last few hundred years. If I can quickly say in China, and I've, I've been to China and I've made the speech there saying, actually, I think this had to come from the Chinese people. The Chinese government has now introduced a, a new phraseology into our thinking, which is eco-civilization. They're saying we should all aim towards an eco-civilization in which we treat the well-being of our ecosystems as equally important as the well-being of ourselves. We have to recognize that we are a part of nature and not apart from nature. That is what's put us into this difficult situation, and that is now the new challenge for for humanity going forward in time. Now, deep and rapid emissions reduction is not going to be enough. Why do I say that? Because these extreme weather events can only get more extreme, but worse than that, we have several tipping points. And what I've just described to you is a tipping point in the Arctic Circle region, which now seems to have gone where we are seeing an irreversible phenomenon happening, the irreversible loss of ice on land from uh, Greenland. And of course, 
this distortion in our uh, jet stream that is causing these extreme weather events. As this melting of ice occurs, it becomes more and more likely that the Atlantic meridional of overturning current, which is responsible for managing heat away from the equatorial region into the Arctic region and cold water away from the Arctic region back into the, the more temperate zones. That, that AMOC, that so-called AMOC, is very likely to be turned off. We know it's been weakening over the last 50 years. Very good measurements have been made. If that weakens completely, frankly, we are in a great deal of trouble. Now, what we therefore also need is the second R. We need to remove excess greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Now, what I'm saying is we have exceeded the pre-industrial era level of greenhouse gases of about 270 parts per million and we have got up above 500 parts per million today and we are now today emitting if i count in methane as i should well over 40 billion tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere per year so we need to take out greenhouse gases at scale with the object of bringing the greenhouse gas levels down to a manageable level for a safe future. And that, I'm afraid, means bringing them down to 350 parts per million or less. That has to be our joint objective. Reduce and remove excess greenhouse gases that are already there so as to re remove all of these threats to the climate systems of the world. But finally, how long will all of that take? This deep and rapid emissions reduction plus removing excess greenhouse gases. As we move forward from the present time, we're only going to make it worse by emitting more greenhouse gases. So we are creating an even bigger debt in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas that must be removed. I believe we need to learn to remove about 30 to 40 billion tons of greenhouse gases a year. Even at that level, it will take us to the end of the century to get back down to 350 parts per million. Therefore, we need to buy time with the third R, which is particularly repairing the North Pole region as, that I've just described. How can we see that we get ice covering the Arctic Ocean right through the 12 months of the year? And in particular, how do we refreeze or keep the layer of ice that is formed during the winter covering the Arctic Ocean through the uh, polar summer period? And that, that means how do we stop the ice melting from Greenland as well? And I believe the, the solution, and this is what we're working on, is to create white cloud cover. And we know how to do this by mimicking nature. When there are storms at sea, you create tiny droplets of water. The very small droplets of water get carried up by up, upgoing drafts of, of air into the upper atmosphere. As this happens, these tiny droplets of water in this up wind lose their water and become all you're left with is a tiny crystal of salt of sodium chloride then as that floats downwards this cloud of salt it picks up water again and creates a white cloud or if it lands on a dark cloud it will lighten the dark cloud now if we can do that it's a massive exercise all the way around the Arctic Circle, but only activate this when the wind is blowing in the right direction to carry clouds over the North Pole region, we might be able to reflect sunlight away from the ice formed during the winter. That's what we are working on. <coughs> All of our work is done as a collaborative program and so this piece of, of work that I've just talked about, we've got 
uh, six research groups around the world invo invoked into that uh, collaboration. The work on uh, removing excess greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, the biggest program we're currently running, and we're working with Chip Fletcher and his colleagues in Hawaii, and we're also working with universities and uh, research workers in other parts of the world on this, which is, can we do what we're calling is uh, biomass regeneration in the oceans, marine biomass regeneration. And the reason I say that is because there's only a fairly recent understanding of the function of whales in the ocean, that whales act as a very important biological pump, not just by moving up and down below the water to, to reach krill, which may be 300 meters down and then up, and bringing fertile material to the surface into the sunlight and creating the possibility of growing plankton, but also the, the whales themselves coming up to uh, generate feces at the surface because they can't do this at uh, the pressure of 300 meters of water. And that means that these regions, if a pod of whales come up, will form a green layer of phytoplankton. And phytoplankton is the initial foodstuff of fish larvae. So with, with that process, you not only regenerate fish, you might in these processes create 100,000 fish, it could be a half a billion, a quarter of a billion fish on each time this happens. Now, what I'm saying is, as we do this, we bring back the whale population to something like it was three or 400 years ago, before whaling was responsible for removing the vast number of whales that we used to have. So the baleen whales that perform the function I've just described are now down at maybe five, 10% or even less of what they used to be. If we can return the population to what they were doing before, we can leave them to act as that biological pump, bringing fertile material up into the sunlit waters. So many, many programs of work have been initiated in an attempt to create the climate repair process, which I believe every one of us needs to commit ourselves to in one way or another. The deep and rapid emissions reduction is where most of us can have some responsibility, whatever we have, means we use for getting around the world, we should avoid emitting carbon dioxide, whatever means we have of eating, we should surely avoid eating so much beef. In fact, maybe we should stop eating all beef, etc. So we can all make a contribution. And I'm saying actually the contribution has to be made at each one of these levels. We need to promote agile political and investment responses. And when I say political responses, we have to go way beyond what we've even come close to in the COP process so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir David, for that fascinating talk. So now I want to say a huge thank you to Sir David and Dr. Charles for speaking today. <laughs> We are very grateful for having you both here and uh, you're very welcome to stay on the call for as long as you like. Um, it's been great having your contributions to the chat as well. Um, uh, but of course, we understand if you need to leave. Uh, so thank you again from everyone uh, and especially from Just Stop Oil for sharing that with us. We are now going to hear from Zoe from Just Stop Oil, who is going to talk about what we can do in 2022 in response to those terrible truths that we have just heard. So. Thank you, Rowan. And thank you, Chip and David. I hope you can hear me okay. <coughs> I'm a little poorly at the moment, but I didn't want to miss this. Um, thank you so much. Um, my voice is also cracking because quite frankly, I'm pretty emotional um, hearing what you've both shared. Um, I'm imagining the other 300 plus people on this call are also um, feeling a whole range of emotions. So I just invite all of us to take a couple of breaths together 
and allow ourselves to not just think, but also feel the reality of this world that we share together and the future that we are facing if we don't all do exactly what Sir David said and take responsibility and commit ourselves to a different future. Um, so a huge, huge thanks to Chip and David for spending that time with us this evening. We do hope that you will continue to join us if you're happy to. Um, there's so much to say. I believe I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to keep it quite brief. Um, there's so much I took away from both of your talks. I'm sure many of us here this evening know a fair bit of what you've shared and have also learned new information. And even if we knew every single element of it, hearing it afresh and hearing it directly from global esteemed experts has an extra weight and it strikes us again. The sheer scale of what we're facing is really hard for us to get our heads and our hearts around and to hold this while still functioning in the world and caring for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. And yet that is exactly what we must do. And the words that you've shared, both of you, and what we know needs to happen is that such stark contrast, as you hinted there, David, uh, of the outcome of COP and of the words that we hear from our politicians, policymakers, media, and in fact, many of the NGOs. But here with Just Stop Oil, we don't talk nonsense. We don't collude. We share the truth and we face it and we take action together. Just as Antonio Guterres only two weeks ago with the launch of the latest IPCC report said, he was talking about the lack of global leadership and he said the abdication of leadership is criminal. And he's absolutely right, isn't he? The situation we are in and our children and grandchildren are facing and the vulnerable around the world are facing right now is criminal. It is deeply, deeply criminal. And quite simply put, we must put our bodies on the machine. For many of us ordinary people, we don't have the opportunity to influence at the tables of those who have the real power. So what else can we do but to put our bodies peacefully in the way of the machine? And to hear fact after fact this evening, some of the ones that just absolutely bowled me out of the blue, for example, Chip saying that emissions are underreported by 23%. And to think about that tipping point of photosynthesis so that plant, the, the basic function of plants on Earth is going to lose the ability to function at some point in temp, uh, temperature rise. And thinking about that, land, all the land ice melting irreversibly, there are so many things that are so hard to get our head around. And yet, our leaders, our supposed leaders, I can't even call them that, our supposed leaders. Even in the UK, when we are supposedly a climate leader and we still hold the presidency for COP, we are still planning 40 new fossil fuel licenses, more than 40 new oil, coal and gas licenses in the UK. And we claim we're a climate leader. That is criminality, hypocrisy and genocide. Um, it's appalling, absolutely appalling. And with current events in Europe, um, with what is happening uh, in the Ukraine, with that Russian aggression funded by fossil fuels, and so much of war and conflict around the world, as we know, is not just caused by fossil fuels, it's funded by fossil fuels, and it causes more and more degradation, harm and suffering. Every single day it continues. And to allow our government, to allow the UK government, led by Boris Johnson, to continue with new fossil fuel licenses in 2022 is disgusting, it's treasonous, and it's a total betrayal of every young person alive today. We know that the International Energy Agency, the director Fassi Birol said in writing last year in May 2021, that if governments are serious about the climate crisis, there can be no new investments in oil, coal and gas from this year. And that was last year. Now, we must not allow our government to do this, but they will do it. 
and they will do it unless we can find enough ordinary, scared, courageous, beautiful humans to lead to peacefully, non-violently stop them. And that's exactly what we plan to do. We know what, we know what befalls us. We know what comes ahead of us if we don't do this. It's very, very clear, set out by Chip and David this evening. But putting it in really, really stark words as an ordinary person and as a mum, we know it means mass hunger, starvation, mass migration, war, conflict, rape and suffering on a gargantuan scale. It also means economic collapse, the collapse of our health and social services, our jobs, our savings, our pensions, and everything that we hold dear. And we also know that the poor and the vulnerable suffer first and suffer most, just as is happening around the world right now. And we're seeing from Syria to Madagascar to Ukraine, we know that with fossil fuels, there can be no peace and no justice. Not only is there no future for humanity or much of life on earth, but even in our societal experiences and our, our existential reality of living on this earth, there will be no peace and no justice with fossil fuels. So civil resistance is the only way forward. It's the only way forward. Doing more of what we've done even to this date, even many of us on this call have been involved in taking civil disobedience and peaceful action. More of what we've already done won't catch this ball and stop it rolling down the hill. Only sustained civil resistance, where we keep peacefully resisting the government that wants to kill us and kill our children and all future generations. We must peacefully resist this genocidal, treasonous action. We cannot let our leaders get away with this. And what we do know is that there are thousands, if not millions of people around the world, young people, parents, grandparents, who are desperate for change. We are not the only people who know this on this call. Many, many people are desperate for change. And yet many of those people do not know what to do. So with Just Stop Oil, hundreds, if not hopefully thousands of us will come together under a coalition with other movements and take peaceful civil resistance action until we force our government to make a statement that they will halt all new licensing and consents for fossil fuel projects and for new projects in the UK. And by doing this, by peacefully putting our bodies on the wheels of the machine, we will not only make British history by forcing legislation change and real climate action, we will also help with other communities of resistance around the world to inspire many, many more people to rise up and take action. We have heard time after time, whether it's from the IPCC or the Committee on Climate Change here on the UK, when policymakers and scientists talk about the situation, they often say civil society needs to help make this change. What we know, the people on this call, you, me, all of us here know, what that really means is sustained, peaceful civil resistance. It's needed, it's essential, and it must happen. We have no alternative. We cannot be a bystander any longer. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> we can't. So I'm gonna end um, what I'm saying before I hand back to Rowan um, to, set, to set out uh, the ask for all of us here this evening. And I'll just preface that by using again the words of Antonio Guterres in his launch of the IPCC report uh, only two weeks ago. He said, now is the time to turn rage into action. And he was absolutely right. All of these emotions we're feeling we need to direct them into non-violent civil resistance, which is love in action. It is our love in action. So this evening, you beautiful humans, thank you for coming here. And I'd like to make an ask to you. 
If you feel at all able to, please sign up to take action with us, with Just Stop Oil or Extinction Rebellion, to the point of arrest at least once. We'll be taking action together during April, and it is going to be love in action in the coalition. If you are not able to take action, or if you are, but you'd also like to do something else to support this campaign, please donate. We know from experience that it costs well over a thousand pounds to support a team to be on the road, traveling and accommodated for a week. So please do give whatever you can. We know from what Chip and David have said that we have no time to waste. And also, if you're in a position to, or you're not in a position to take action, or perhaps you can do both, you can take another support role with Just Stop Oil, with the campaign. You can support by mobilising and recruiting more people, or perhaps consider taking another support role. Again, there is no time to waste. Our children and grandchildren and the babies yet unborn are relying on us. We're the only generation who can know this and take action in time. Thank you. I'll pass back to Rowan. Thank you so much for that, Zoe. Really moving words. And next, we will be hearing for, from some people who have decided to do just that. People, just normal people, not with specific backgrounds in climate change, who have decided that they will take action with Just Stop Oil. So first, we will be hearing from Zach about his story. Zach, are you ready to take over? Yeah, uh, hiya. Uh, so... My name's Zach. Uh, I'm 15. I'm from the southeast of England. And yeah, all of that is just incredibly overwhelming. Um, you know, hearing the best and the most credible of the science is um, it's, it's a massive shock because you almost a lot of the time don't want to believe that it's true. And, um, and it is that it's that very thing. It is true. And um I think that's why a lot of us here have been pushed into, in a way, signing up to take action um, with Just Stop Oil in April 2022. And obviously that uh, to the point where myself, uh, I've signed up, is because of that element of fear, uh, being scared of what future I face if we don't act. So it's sort of like that, instinct of you know there is nothing else to do than to than to do this very thing which is to take action with just stop oil um and that's that's why I've signed up because I'm I'm scared I'm a young person um and up until maybe around a year ago I had I had no clue about the climate crisis and what affects it, it how, how it's going to thre threaten my generation and when finding out it's sort of that element of disbelief you don't believe it and obviously like I said a minute ago you hear it all from people like Chip and David who are world leading experts in this field and it, it's it's unbelievable that disbelief is crazy and that's why I've signed up to to do this um, later on this year and obviously it, it is quite a sacrifice for a young person obviously it's like people say you know you're putting your career on the line you're putting you know jobs and university places but to be honest there's nothing to lose there is no universities or no jobs if we don't sort this crisis out um and like Adam McKay, the director of Don't Look Up, said, I'm, you know, I'm a great believer in stopping the gears of production. And that's the only choice we are left with when our government are putting profit before the, you know, the, the current generation and the next generations. And that's sort of why myself and so many others have decided to take this action and sign up. And, you know, I don't know if it's going to do anything. All I've got to do is hope. I've got to hope that the government have a heart and that they decide to do the best to safeguard 
my future. Um, and just a quote from an activist, uh, her name was Regan Russell. She was an animal rights activist. She said, I don't know if it does any good, but I know doing nothing does no good. And that is why I'm doing this. And um, thank you everyone for coming. It genuinely means a lot. And um, to see that people care, it's really brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. That was really moving. And it is important to recognise that is a huge sacrifice for young people to make who have such a future ahead of them. Now we will be hearing from another volunteer. Uh, is Sandra here? Yeah. Um, Brilliant. Hi, everybody. And thank you to Chip and David and Zoe and Zach. And listening to all of you I do I, I why have I why have I offered to get arrested because as Zoe says I can no longer stand by while the government does nothing our governments are not going to save us it's up to each and every one of us to stand up now and put our bodies in the way of the machine as Zoe said um my story, um, I live in Morecambe in the northwest. I'm called Sandra. And my story is probably the same as many of yours, if you're of a certain age. Um, I'm 66 this year, so it's happened in my lifetime. Therefore, I owe it to young people to do something. And for a long while, for a long while, I thought I was doing something like Many of you caring, decent people, you know, I subscribed to the worthwhile well, organisations. I go on protests, I sign petitions, I chip in a few quid with every signature, I compost, I rescue waste food and redistribute it. I've been doing that for several years. I'm constantly, I pick up litter. You know, I go on community committees. You know the stuff because you all do it. You know, you are decent, caring people. Well, I've been doing that since probably 50 years, I reckon now. And um, as I say, I, I thought I was doing something, but I did have a bit of malaise, you know, that sort of uneasiness, like, oh, you know, climate crisis, you know. And... Um, then I went along to a Just Stop Oil climate crisis talk in Lancaster. And um, to tell you the truth, I wasn't going to go, but I'd been roped in to do the leafleting. So I thought, oh, I better go because I've been sticking these leaflets on people's doors. So it's a bit hypocritical not to go, you know, I'll be over in two minutes. I can get on with my life. And um, Zoe, Zoe was the speaker. And um, partway through her, her talk, I just had the cliched moment, you know, the, the light bulb, the penny dropped, ping, you know. Um, and I thought, right, political activism has become a bit of a hobby for me. You know, it's like Monday XR meetings, Tuesday Tai Chi, you know, it. it it gets like that for, for all of us, doesn't it? It just becomes another thing that you do. But listening to Zoe, I realised, actually, I can no longer stay on the periphery. You know, I was always that person that in the XR rebellions, in the Stop HS2 actions, yeah, I was there, I was getting braver, you know, I'd never glued myself on, but I would stay in the kettle, I would get the three verbal warnings from the police. And as the person next to me got arrested, I would, I'm going now, sorry, I'm leaving. I would slip away, slip away, maybe go to do a bit of sightseeing whilst I was down in London, you know. And I realise that I can't carry on like that. I can't carry on. Yes, I've been, I've grown up. You know that invisible line of getting arrested? There is some invisible line that we've all been brought up to either respect that line or be terrified of it. 
Now, I'm number three in nine children and I grew up on a council estate here in Morecambe. And my mum's mantra was, don't get in trouble with the police. Don't, don't, we can't have the shame. We can't have the police car turning up in front of the house, you know. So I have always been a law abiding, dutiful, decent citizen. And now I realise that everything I've been doing isn't having an effect. I am not turning, I am not turning the course at all. So now I am prepared to cross that invisible line and pledge, pledge to be arrested. I've actually upped my pledge to, to multiple arrests because we're gonna do what it takes. We're gonna do, and it's only by standing together that we can do something that and as Zach said and other people have said I'd rather go down doing something than doing nothing so please if you're able to come and stand with us and I'll just add my last point is just stop oil has got an amazing structure you know when I left that meeting having pledged I was in a state of euphoria and the next morning I woke up feeling ill, absolutely terrified, doom, gloom. And then over the last six weeks, I've been in touch with lots of people on the Just Stop Oil campaign. I've been away on a couple of weekends. I've done non-violent resistance training. And wow, the support, the love, the amount of I don't know, just lovely, lovely people, decent people like ourselves, you know. So there's a place there for everybody. And um, I beseech you, just step up. Thank you so much, Sandra, for your personal speech. And I want to say thank you to both of our volunteers who've come and spoken today, um, not just for your incredible statements but also for your bridge and your sacrifice